Microphone on, microphone on. Okay, I've got it working again. I know a couple people are here. Yay, yes, you can hear me. So I'm going to type, I can hear you. Anybody? I've got two people here. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Um, we'll wait till a couple more people. Uh, XX Wood, um, uh, were you the one that asked the question about Baroque instruments uh, prior to me rebooting? Okay. So with uh, Baroque instruments, the answer is no. And here's why. Uh, Baroque instruments are tuned differently than um, modern instruments. And I'm not just talking about uh, the difference between A440 and A415. Uh, the scales themselves are tuned differently. So when I was studying Baroque bassoon, uh, one of the things that we, we had to learn is there's a difference between uh, G sharp and A flat both have different fingerings, and so with those intonation uh, discrepancies, using Baroque instruments in a modern ensemble is not a good way to go. Welcome back, Emily. Thanks for being patient. I hope this does not go out again. Um, this YouTube is being a pain in the butt. All right, what else do we got? Hi, Juan. Uh, my coffee's gone cold. Cold coffee. Cold espresso, actually. This is just pure bitter. Like a cup of espresso. Yes, Juan, and uh, I answered it for the um, for the user. I'll I'll do a brief summary. The answer on uh, baroque um, baroque instruments is generally no, because there are some major intonation differences. Baroque instruments are just tuned differently to different scales and different temperaments than modern instruments. A flat clarinet in the concert band. Okay, this is a weird question. Um, all right, Carlos, hold on to that. I'll get there in a second. So A-flat clarinet historically was a member of the concert band. Um, uh, it is still used today in Italy, where they'll use it in their biggest bands. Uh, Austria and Germany will sometimes use it. Uh, well, during research for the book, um, I found a few um, pieces. There's actually a piece by Bruckner that uses it. Oh, I want Bruckner's pieces for band. And yes, Anton Bruckner wrote a couple pieces for band, a few marches. Uh, that said, um, there are some inherent problems with a lot of A-flat clarinets having to do with intonation. Uh, one of the manufacturers, um, and I won't name names, there are two or three manufacturers right now that make them, but one of the manufacturers produces an instrument that is so out of tune that... Um, that the note is more than a half step off of where it should be. Meaning if you fingered a, um, a C, it's playing a C sharp plus nearly a D. So uh, because of that, uh, I originally had a part for A flat clarinet in my symphony two. And once I started talking to players, it's like, uh, -uh that can't even be used. So um, it were a good instrument to uh, be had. And yes, I have played a flat clarinet once and the instrument I played was a good instrument and could play fairly well in tune, but it's a literal crapshoot whether or not you're going to be able to, um, to take care of it. Do sax and clarinet players usually double on bassoon? Should more? Typically, no. Um, 
you will find a few um, sax and clarinet players who can play bassoon. It's actually more common the other way around. to find bassoon players who can double on sax. Uh, case in point, myself, I am a uh, bassoonist. And uh, my primary double is sax. So with um, saxophone, it's super simple to pick it up. Clarinet, on the other hand, is much more difficult for me. If you ever see me playing clarinet on one of the videos on this channel, you know I suck at it. I get a little bit better, but... <clears throat> All right. Uh, but in general, you're not going to find a lot of uh, people except for uh, woodwind doublers, Broadway doublers, who are going to go to different instruments outside of their own family. Can you name some good instrument duets in band composition? I know E flat clarinet and alto flute are good. Oh, that's uh, that is a it, that question right there. Uh, XX Wood is a dissertation in itself. Um, the any instrument with a creative composer can be paired with any other instrument. It's all dependent on texture. It's all dependent on um, what you need, what you want, what sound you're going for. So to give a blanket answer to that, it's virtually impossible. But if you got some, some suggestions, I can go through that. What about Bassett Horn? Okay, Bassett Horn. I love the Bassett Horn. Um, yes, Emily, I do have entire about a third of band orchestration volume one is devoted to instrument doublings, instrument pairings. Uh, so basset horn. Um, there are band works that call for basset horn. Um, I just this is not a basset horn. This is uh, the E flat alto clarinet. But this, in general, is our um, oh, the peg fell out. Our uh, basset horn equivalent. Um, are you Emily? Are you uh, going yay because I got the alto clarinet out, or because I've got a, a peg on my alto clarinet? Yes. Okay. By the way, Emily, I I strongly suggest getting a peg and putting it on yours. Man, it makes so much difference and frees up the hands. And I I know you've said you have some some hand problems. This takes all the weight off. Anyway, um, Bassett Horn. Um, in fact, there is a lot of um, a lot of early um, 18th and 19th century and early uh, 20th century band music that calls for Bassett Horn, starting with Mozart, the the great Grand Partita, uh, the all both Mendelssohn works, the Overture of the Trier March. Um, there are band works by Rimsky Korsakov and the latter works of Richard Strauss, the, the last two pieces, the uh, from the Invalids Workshop and the, the latter suite. Uh, yeah, the suite or the sonatine, uh, the suite. Uh, those works are great for Bassett Horn. Um, in uh, talking with some players around the area, uh, the, the big... Um, Wind band around here is the the Dallas Winds, and they did a uh, recording of all of Granger's works uh, a couple of years ago. And I've been told that uh, for all the alto clarinet parts, they actually had somebody play basset horn instead, and everything was just transposed a step. Um, that said, uh, I am probably the only person. Um, in the history of ever that has written a band work that includes both alto and basset horn. Uh, my symphony two has two basset horns and two altos in it. Okay. So um, let's see. I think there was something I'm going to have to go up just a little bit. Um, all right. Uh, do you think too many unison doublings in band music sounds bad? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, the more you have uh, unison doublings, the less important every individual becomes. Um, doublings are great for producing power, but after a while, all powerful all the time, and 
it gets boring. You've got to have a contrast uh, in textures. And that's uh, one of my biggest problems with a lot of band music is there is just no texture color, no difference between sections. And that's something I really uh, talk about a lot in both books. Uh, instrument... Uh, um, Uh, Emily, it will it will help with the the left hand. Uh, I'm late, but I wonder to know about the seventh position in brass family. When using the fourth valve, I mean the the fake pedal B on B flat tuba. Okay, also and also trombone. All right. Um. Well, uh, here's the here is the issue with the seventh position and a trigger. So we'll talk about uh, trombone because it's a little, little easier to deal with. Tubas all have um, slightly different variations. Essentially, what happens when you put the trigger down on a trombone is that it puts the instrument into F. Okay? That's, that's pretty understandable. Um, uh, XX Wood, no. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that here in a second. All right, so you've got your trombone sitting in B flat. You put the trigger down, it's sitting in F. The difference here is when the instrument is in F, each slide position, it has to be longer to compensate. Therefore, the furthest out the slide can go is equivalent only to about a sixth position. So it can only go to six. There is no B natural. Um, the only way you can fake the pedal B on a typical four valve um, B flat tuba is to uh, pull out as many slides as possible while playing four valves down or have a, a compensating B flat that they use in the British fat brass bands or a five valve B flat. Otherwise, it's not happening. It's just the physics don't allow it. Um, so, all right, so I've got my bass clarinet here. Um, so I'm not going to play it, but I'll kind of explain what, what's happening. Okay, this right here, it, you can adjust minor tuning over the whole thing, but in order to increase the, the tuning of an entire instrument half a step, the whole instrument has to be proportioned up one twelfth. So every distance between every tone hole has to be one twelfth bigger than it is now. And I, I can get this to where it will be in tune for one note, maybe two or three notes, but every other note won't work. All right, uh, Michael, what do you think is better in the orchestral symphonic combination? Oba de More, English horn, or both together? Depends on context. Um, uh, Obo de More is um, not common. Uh, you don't see them often. English horn is far, far more common. Um, uh, that said, if I need either one, I've got players I can call on that I, I, you know, I know really well and can bring either instrument. I, but again, it depends on texture. Uh, my, my, um, you know. My advice is right for English horn, unless you know you can get a Demore. Um, Demore is really only going to be useful for um, a sound, a tone color change, and it's not a, um, a range extension by any means. In fact, it's only a major second below the oboe. All right, let me see if I can get the bass clarinet back in its stand without things falling over. All right, what else do we got? Are there any 12-tone works for band? Oh, let me think. Uh, I am sure that there are. Um, surprisingly, there is... Um, uh, there is a piece by Arnold Schoenberg uh, that is in G major. 
It's one of his later works, the Opus uh, 43A, originally written for um, uh, for band, uh, but it's not 12 tone. Um, uh, off the top of my head, I cannot think of any 12 tone works, but they, they do exist. I love Mahler too, but that's weird because I won't ever listen to the other symphony by him. Well, there are um, nine other symphonies. Um, they are all fantastic. Uh, uh, I do have a special place for Mahler too. In fact, if you guys want, I can tell the story about how I first heard Mahler too because it's kind of incredible. Um, why is it so hard to tune an E flat instrument? Um, it's not. I mean, I've got sitting around me one, two, three, four, and five instruments in E flat. Um, and they're not terribly difficult to tune, with really the exception of the E flat sopranino sax. And that's just because it's so small. Um, all right. Yes, please, on the Mahler story. Okay. Um, so my 18th birthday, um, my cousins uh, were singing in the, the Dallas Symphony Chorus. And they said, uh, hey, you want to go and see our final rehearsal of Mahler 2? Like, yes, please. I like Mahler. Uh, I, I had actually never heard Mahler 2 in that time. So I go with them down to the Meyerson Symphony Center in downtown Dallas. And there I am in a completely empty uh symphony center is just me in the audience hearing Mahler 2 uh with full orchestra chorus soloist it just um it just blows you away um i think it's just the e flat and the alto clarinet not having too many dedicated players willing to work on tuning absolutely correct and there are some some faulty instruments. Um, I don't know if this is a good question, but I recently saw a post on whether or not to use big time signatures in scores. I was wondering if it was used in band. It's not typically used in band. The only time you really need to use it is in Hollywood when you're dealing with larger scores. Um, otherwise, it looks tacky. Um, just don't use the big time signatures. Why are orchestral transcriptions for band always so full of errors? Because orchestral transcriptions for band suck. I have yet to hear a good one. Um, and this is me being my most opinionated. I do not like orchestral transcriptions in band. Play something original for the medium. Don't play um, something that's transcribed. Uh, case in point, one of the first transcriptions I ever played was... Um, the Overture to Marriage of Figaro. Um, and being a bassoonist, that's kind of one of our, our big orchestral excerpts. Here's the problem. The band version that I played first was in B flat. The real version is in D. I had to relearn everything. Just say no to orchestral transcriptions. Kirkpatrick fanfare. I'm not sure what that means. Sounds Irish. Trombone, tuba, euphonium are transposing or not? No, they are not transposing instruments. I mean, the, the fundamental of the instrument may be B flat, or in the case of the tuba, F, um, E flat C, but they are never written as transposing instruments unless you are writing for the British Brass Band. And only then. Uh, it was a Rite of Spring transcription. I've heard the Rite of Spring transcription. Um, no. The Rite of Spring is one of those, it is it is by definition defined by its orchestration. To change the orchestration of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring to me is sacrilege. You just don't do it. Yes, Norse musician, uh, the band version, the whole woodwind section is playing at the beginning. And it's, it's to me, crass. It's, it has none of the, the delicacy, the lightness that Mozart wanted. 
Emily, yikes to, to which one? My my opinions or All right, anybody got else have any uh questions? Yikes to the band version. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and plus it being in B flat. Why does the horn have uh, such a different timbre than all the other brass instruments? A really good question here. It has to do with the fact that um, the horn uses 16 uh, partials, whereas most other brass instruments use eight partials to cover their whole range. The horn has a full octave more range that is traditionally used in the other instruments. Uh, because of that, the horn is playing... Um, essentially an octave higher than the other uh, brass instruments, which causes uh, the, the partials are closer. And the closer the partials get, the more um, forced and heroic the sound can become. Um, also, if you t there are some other factors here. The, the mouthpiece design of the horn is completely different than the other um, brass instruments. The horn's mouthpiece is a deep funnel, whereas most of the brass piece mouthpieces have a cut mouthpiece. Uh, one, I recently had an arrangement that I did for band and noticed some balance problems with the clarinet section. Do you have any tips for me to balance them better? Uh, one, if you could say um, exactly what the balance problems are, it it's just really... Um, um, just dependent on um, uh, how what the problems were. Uh, other ones, we've got one one in Puerto Rico, one one in Spain, if I remember correctly. I remember having read the score of Stravinsky's Nightingale, the inclusion of lower E. Okay, so Stravinsky, Song of the Nightingale. Uh, yes, the, he does have some low Ds in there. Um, uh, the the best answer to that is he just made made a mistake. I, I mean, it, that's as simple as it gets, unfortunately. Uh, um, Mozart um, had notes below that, uh, but we did not start using those notes really until the 1950s or 1960s. So Stravinsky's D's that he wrote, um, I think it's just a, an error there. And Stravinsky has lots of errors. Um, it's like I asked for a D. Which piece, Emily, do you remember? High school... Um, uh, let's see. Suggestions on a bassoon to buy. Um, buy the best bassoon you can afford. Um, stay away from the Chinese instruments, the checkmate instruments. If, uh, older used instruments can be really good. Foxes are all um, really just, you know, they're good across the board in general. Uh, but the, the, the best instrument you can buy with your money. Without knowing budget, that's a hard one to answer. Uh, my band had this argument saying that we don't need that many clarinets, but I said we do because the clarinets, in my opinion, oh, no, you do not need 30 clarinets. Um, the only time I could see needing 30 clarinets maybe is on a marching field. Um, uh, um no, the 30 clarinets is not not ideal. You it's just it's too many. You don't you don't need it. Um my my preference is one on a part, six uh 16. No, you don't need that many. One on a part or two on a part. Pure wind ensemble is um there are pieces like uh, Husa's uh music for Prague 1968 that you have to have a minimum of nine because each uh, clarinet part divides into three. Uh, I don't see you needing any more than nine for any piece. Uh, if you need more than that, you have too many brass players and you need to start shooting them. Don't shoot your brass players. Okay. 
Um, which of your instruments was were the easiest to learn? Saxophone. Uh, saxophone, uh, only because it is the most logical of the instruments. Um, after I, I picked up saxophone after three years of bassoon, and I was literally able to play the full chromatic scale within 30 minutes on it. Um, um, give us this day. Uh, were you wrong to do so? No. Uh, next time I talk to Matt Maslanka, I will ask him about that. Um, I talked to him yesterday, in fact. Um, if you don't know, I, I took uh, several composition lessons from David Maslanka. So uh, I knew him a little bit. Uh, 16, I, what about the military band I've seen with 13 clarinets in concert? Uh, okay, so if we're... Um, talking like the Marine Band, um, so, uh, if you look at uh, those 13 clarinets, I'm thinking that two of those are basses and one of those is a contrabass. So, I mean, you're still looking at, uh, and one of them is going to be an E flight. So that still gets you your nine B flight clarinets. When do I come to Brazil? Whenever I'm invited and um, they uh, pay for me to go down there, I would love to go down to Brazil. Is it important for a band composer to know how to write for marching band? Um, uh, no, it's not really. Um, uh, I don't touch the marching band um, at all. It's such a different beast that um, I, I I would not um, know where to start on that. Um, I know that, um, back to David Maslanka, someone asked him if they could transcribe one of his pieces for marching band, and he flat out said, no, but I will write you a piece. It's only $10,000. That's about the going rate. So you don't need to have uh, marching band skills. Um, my main instrument, Bill, is bassoon. I uh, have a master's degree in bassoon performance. Um, yeah, D Emily, don't worry about it. It's, a, it's an American thing. What are the top three instruments you think should be added to the standard band lineup? Easy. Well, we'll start off with bass oboe. Um, I absolutely think that uh, bass oboe should be uh, much more standard. Um, um, yeah, I've I've played bass oboe a handful of times, and it's always just a fun experience. And it, um, the when I uh, played the planet several years back, I sat right behind the bass oboe player, and it just um transforms the section um after that um it depends on what you mean by standard band lineup because there's no real standard i think uh if we just go with our standard what you see in everyday band performances i i want a bass sax to be there i think bass sax is really important um Um, and then probably, uh, it, it, it depends, it depends on what you need uh, in the piece. I think you can add a different instrument. I've never used the same instrumentation twice in any of my pieces. So I think that should tell you something. Um, mellophone or mellophonium. Okay. So, um, we have, so, uh, I, I'm assuming this is a question, Michael. Mellophone, there are two instruments with the name mellophone. There's the older circular form that was pitched generally in E flat. It was shaped like a, a horn, um, uh, but with piston valves. Um, it's not really used anymore. The modern mellophone is the marching instrument. The mellophonium is uh, the 
the instrument developed by Kahn in the 50s and 60s, most famously used by the Stan Kenton Orchestra. But the problem with the Melophonium is they were never built in tune, so they're just notoriously difficult to play. Uh, the mellophone, the modern mellophone itself, is basically an alto flugelhorn. And I talked to Jack Canstall about this, from Canstall Brass. And they, in fact, the only difference between an alto flugelhorn and the mellophone is the size of the bell. Mellophone has a 10 inch bell, whereas an alto flugelhorn has an 8 inch bell. Why is uh, not that common flugelhorn with four valves? There are plenty of four valve flugels out there. Uh, it just adds a lot of weight to the instrument. Flugelhorn is uh, already uh, a more heavy instrument than the trumpet, but uh, there are plenty of four valves out there. The most uh, popular one is the Getson instrument. Um, when I was at undergrad, uh, we all used uh, four valve, oh, sorry, hit the computer, four valve um, Getson flugelhorns. Uh, yes, use, Hulse does use bass oboe. Uh, uh, Landon, I do not know that user. Uh, I'm thinking that may be a joke to try and get me to say that. And if it is, uh, you'll probably be banned. Trombone with valves, is it useful? Um, not particularly. Um, you actually, what you will find is a lot of late 19th century uh, orchestral music was written with uh, valve trombones in mind. All the Dvorak symphonies uh, were done with valve trombones. Uh, all the Verdi operas were done with trombones. In fact, the Vienna Philharmonic used valve trombones up until the time of Gustav Mahler, and Mahler insisted that they go back to slide trombones. The only exception to that was the bass trombone player in the Vienna Phil would use a four valve F bass trombone if needed. And they used that at least until the 60s. Uh, otherwise, valve trombone, um, if you're using it for jazz, yeah, if you need, uh, there are some technical things it can do, but stick with slide. You think Renaissance dance music could ever work with a modern wind orchestra? Absolutely. Go look at Bob Margolis' uh, Terpsichore. Um, that's probably the uh, best um, Renaissance dance music uh, arrangement out there. Uh, when I was band director, to answer Bill's question, I have been a band director. I'm not now. Full-time composer. Um, uh, we did... Um, uh, arrangement again by Bob Margolis of um, the Battle Pavon uh, uh, by Tillman Susato. And that's a, a great Renaissance um, uh, band uh, inspired piece. In fact, a lot, there's a wealth of Renaissance um, uh, music that can be uh, adapted for band. Uh, which sounds better overall, straight soprano or curved soprano? It's the player, not the horn. Um, I personally uh, have a, a curvy. I like my curvy, um, but, uh, you know, truth be told, there's not a huge difference. A lot of it um, has to do with the fact that the bell is pointed back toward the player on this one. Um, so the player is going to hear um, a slightly different sound. Oh, I've had a cork fall off of it. I've got to get that replaced. Back to my repair table on that one. Um, let's see. Um, how do you feel about potential for extended techniques, so multiphonics, um, on saxophone or bassoon being used um, in a wind ensemble? They are fine to be used. However, if you're going to be writing multiphonics, you have to include the fingering. If you do not include the fingering with it, you will not uh, convey your meaning properly. Um, um, so, yes, uh, I've played several pieces that call for uh, extended techniques. Um, they have their place. Um, let's see, uh, how, mar how important is the harmonic series for you as a composer? Uh, extremely important. You, it's the basis of all music theory. 
you cannot understand music without understanding the harmonic series. Um, I mean, that's how all instruments function. It's um, it's how our harmony is derived. So you've got to understand the harmonic series. You know, brass players in particular, that's all they do is the harmonic series all day long. Curve soprano sounds a bit warmer, in my opinion, less brilliant, a little bit. Um, again, it you can get a lot more variation just by the mouthpiece. Are there band works that uses the sax's altissimo range? Yes. Um, Maslanka it was notorious for writing um, altissimo parts. Uh, I know he writes at least up to high A's, B flats, and occasionally C's in some of his works, including those notes for uh, soprano. Um, Stravinsky should have added a bass recorder to the Rite of Spring. Don't you agree? No, I don't agree. I think the Rite of Spring is just perfect as is, except for the out of range notes and the, the bass trumpet part. Valve trombone in Mexican bandas. Hi, Rufus. How are you? Um, yes, cut down uh, valves to C. Um, Rufus, have you done some of those um, cut jobs? <laughs> Rufus is uh, a band instrument repair person, and I've got to write him a piece. Uh, by the way, Rufus, how is the repair on the uh, alto sarusophone going? I'm I'm anxious to hear about that. All right. Am I got any other questions? Yeah, I figured you've got to rebuild the whole thing, basically, don't you? Do you think the saxophone should be lowered to A like the berry? Yes, actually, I do. Um, I have seen some players um, extend saxes down to A. Um, it's particularly... Um, uh, useful on something like the soprano sax. If you want to do uh, violin transcriptions, that low A will give you a G, the lowest note of the violin. Um, as long as they can be worked out mechanically and acoustically, I, I am all in favor of extending all the saxophones half a step to low A. Uh, of course, what's funny is I'm surrounded by six sizes of saxophone and not one of them has a low A, including my uh, lovely low B flat berry. Uh, do you think amplification could be used in a wind band to create balance between the band with the woodwinds? Um, I don't think it's going to be as successful as you think, Seth. Um, I th the only time it really works is with something like uh, bass flute, tenor flute. Um that just doesn't uh, just doesn't cut through. Uh, or the other time that you'll see it is with a soloist. Uh, do you th which sounds prettier, alto sarusophone or alto saxophone? I honestly cannot answer that. I'm waiting on Rufus to get his alto sarusophone rebuilt so I can hear it. Uh, he, I've got to write him a piece for that instrument. And um, I'm just kind of waiting to get a sound picture in my head. I, it's, I've heard one recording of an alto sarusophone and it was not a good player. I won't comment much further past that. Uh, Bohumel Med. I do not know that. Is that a person or an instrument, Raphael? Um, a deco contrabass recorder, not recorder, clarinet. Um, an author. I don't know the name, so uh, I'll have to, to look that up. Um, so deco contrabass doesn't even make sense. It's not a, a real term. Uh, benefits to string bass in the wind band. Okay. So string bass, this is a, a tricky one. Um, I, the, um, 
the piece I'm writing right now, my Symphony 3, is the first time I have used a string bass in any of my band works. And the the follow-up was that, do you think you need more than one? Uh, if it's a large band, I actually think two is a little bit more appropriate. Uh, and you'll see that with some of the um, larger ensembles. Um um, Eastman Wind Ensemble now uses two. The North Texas Wind Symphony uses two. Um, it just gives you a little bit more um, cutting through the, the larger wind groups. Um, <coughs> just a second. Oh, that is fully cold espresso. Uh, so I, I like using two, uh, and that's what I'm using in my piece now. Um, it adds, um, a little bit of extra weight on the bottom. The, the pizzicato is, um, really, um, I think the most important aspect. Uh, so yes, U.S. Air Force Band uses, uh, Chelly. Uh, they have for a long time. In fact, they had cello before they had saxophones. So they added cellos first and then later on would add saxophones in. Still use it. Um, I need to talk to Bob Thurston about that. Yes, deco means 10. Um, however, when we uh, name instruments, it's based on eights. So octo, yes. Deca, no. Circle, uh, does the 12 notes really come from the fifth circle? Yes, but actually what happens with the fifth circle is you end up getting about 15 notes because as you get further and further up, the uh, notes start stretching a little bit and we just compress them down to 12. But essentially, yes. So just keep going up uh, fifths and you get all the way to uh, 12. Um, why, uh, the point of adding violin, uh, the, the adding celli. Um it is something that goes back. Uh, the earliest piece I can think of right off the top of my head that uses them is Berlioz's uh, Symphony Funebre et Triomphal, uh, the Funeral and Triumphal Symphony. Pardon my terrible French. I'm sure Emily can correct that. Um, but it uses a full section of cellos and basses in it. And the, the addition is um, for warming up the section uh, there are some more modern pieces that use it. Um, James Barnes' Third Symphony has a cello section. Uh, I think uh, Johann de May's Third, Fourth, and Fifth Symphonies use it. Maybe even Number Two use a section of cello. Uh, Philip Sparks' Dance Movements uh, has a cello section. So there's quite a few of them. Uh, best Collegiate Wind Ensemble, and you can't say the one you played in. I wasn't going to say the one I played in. In fact, uh, the, my undergrad ensemble has been completely changed after I left. But typically you go back to, say, Eastman Wind Ensemble. I mean, that's kind of the, the founding father of wind ensembles. Um, UNT, uh, the wind symphony there is pretty high up, and I can go see them on a regular basis. Um, would you ever consider a small string section in a band or treating them like another woodwind family? Interesting concept. Um, I don't think it will work entirely well. And at that point, you really don't have a band anymore. Um, cellos and basses, yes. I have I have been to one band concert where they brought out a section of violins, but they were doing the original orchestration of the um not Revel, the Gershwin Piano Concerto in F. And the original version of that had a section of eight violins plus the wind section. Does a recorder quartet or group have any place in wind ensemble or orchestra? What are your opinions about recorders? Ah, I love recorder. In fact, uh, I studied recorder pretty extensively in grad school. So I'm one of those people. I picked up recorder in grad school and studied it as more of a uh, professional instrument. Um. I think that uh, recorders absolutely can be used. Um, I have not used them in any of my completed pieces yet. Uh, I had a, uh, a symphony. If you ever followed my blog, you knew that I was um, writing a big symphony called Alfheim, and that just completely fell apart because it was 
uh, unwieldy and not very good. Uh, but I had the quarters in there, and you know, I've got you know. Right here, I mean, I've got a whole family of recorders next to me that I've used. This is my base recorder that doesn't work very well because somebody drilled holes in it. Not me. Um, I played a piece. Uh, Emily, what piece was it that you played? Uh, has electric guitar or bass been used in band? Yes. More of the electric bass and the electric guitar. Uh, and you... Um, I'd have to do a literature search on that, but I'm sure you can find pieces. Uh, we're playing dance movements. Yeah, dance movements is a beautiful piece, and that last movement is a nightmare. Oh, my God. That's one of the most difficult things I've ever played. If you had a low C contrabass clarinet, wouldn't the C be a B-flat zero? Yes. So the lowest note on a contrabass clarinet that goes down to written C, which would be a written C3, sounds B-flat zero. Looking for a piece to play with my friends. Bass clarinet, violin, and flute. Any suggestions? I don't know anything by with that um, uh, ensemble, but you can always commission friendly composers to write you something. That's um, uh, always a suggestion. Sword in the Crown by Gregson, I think, had recorders, double by flutes. Uh, yes, and you'll find that flute players generally will be... Um, uh, the ones to play recorder, though actually bassoon players probably have a better time with recorder than will flute players because the fingerings are nearly identical. Uh, do I like the works of Vaclav Nelly Bell? Oh, man, I have not uh, played Nelly Bell since high school. I remember liking it, but it's been so long since I've heard or played any Nelly Bell. I don't know if uh, I can rightfully comment. Yeah, last movement of dance movement is uh, dance movement is a nightmare. Uh, yeah, I played that dance movements in high school. The that running sixteenth note passage at um, one forty four is just insane. Uh, Ghost train favorite bassoon concerto. Man, my favorite bassoon concerto is. Um, I, I love the John Williams bassoon concerto. That was the one I spent the most time working on. Um, the five sacred trees. I performed that uh, as my final graduate school recital. I spent a full year and a half learning that piece. Um, but aside from that, uh, you know, you go back to Mozart and Weber concertos. And again, I've spent so much time working on those that, you know, you, you can't go wrong with either one of them. Mozart was, is, I think, probably the hardest nut to crack as far as bassoon concertos go. Do I like Ravel, Mother Goose? I absolutely love Ravel. Um, <laughs> in fact, I have literally on my bedside table right now uh, Daphne and Chloe, and I read that as I'm going to sleep, like, you know, not late night reading material. So I'm just reading the score to Daphne. Um, don't like the music of Eric Whitaker. Uh, I kind of have to agree. Whitaker gets a little, to, to me personally, it just gets a little monotonous and repetitive. Yes, of course, how can you not love Ravel, the master orchestrator? I don't, a very few composers could touch on uh, Ravel as uh, an orchestrator. I th uh, Michael, I think Whitaker is probably better as a choral composer than he is as a band composer. Um, it, it, I've I've played quite a bit of Whitaker's stuff. Uh, I played Ghost Train. I did Look Sorumque. They're they're okay. They just never left a real memorable impression to me. Uh, Bill, yes, I, I have uh, listened to that Radio Lab episode several times. I bet that's what you're referring to—the unraveling or unraveling. Um, that's it's, it's an interesting theory, uh, though we can't fully support that um, by um, with actual data. Do I currently play in a wind band? No, I play in a jazz band though, which is interesting. Um, so I've I've 
filling in our our town has a a jazz band and i'm uh, the barry sax chair there now working mutes for saxophone well one I mean like that this is a alto saxophone mute and it goes right in the bell here it dampens the overtones a little bit <laughs> mute in so i don't know if that comes across very clearly on the microphone but it does lower the decibel level just a little bit it lowers the uh the overtones uh i've never experienced this on bassoon but what note comes out with every with everything open uh i'm gonna assume you mean with everything open uh, wait, you just mean no fingers down? If no fingers down, that's what we call open F. And that's just you know, F in the bass clef. I have a whole, uh, one, I have a whole set of these um, uh, for soprano, alto, and tenor. I don't have a Barry Sax one. This literally costs me about four bucks on eBay. I kind of like them. In fact, um, my friend Richard Bobo, who's doing the, the sub contrabassoon, got one of these on my suggestion to use on his contrabassoon because if you don't know contrabassoon, bell is a um, alto saxophone bell that's just been turned upside down. So we can use this as a contrabassoon mute as well. Uh, I don't have one um, for Barry sax, though. They, just haven't, they don't make one like this for it. Why is it so hard for a beginner to play anything fast on oboe? It's hard for a beginner to play anything on oboe. Um, the, the analogy we've always used is, all right, stick your thumb in your mouth and blow. If you can get out a, um, a sound, you can play the oboe. The oboe just has so much uh, pressure behind it. It's, it's not really something... Um, uh, that a, a young student can really control very well. Um, do I plan to continue the Instrumentarium podcast? Not no on the Instrumentarium podcast, but I have an idea for something different along that. And yes, eventually I'm going to get back to the Lincolnshire Posey series. If you guys don't know, um, I was doing something on Patreon where I was doing just complete in-depth analysis of the instrumentation and orchestration of Lincolnshire Posey. Uh, one, it'd be interesting. What kind of effects could you achieve with the muted sax? It basically is just a timbre change. Uh, it softens it. I have, um, um, scored for muted sax exactly once. There's a passage in, uh, Symphony 2 Forest Dreams where I have all the lower saxes go to mute because I needed really a triple piano a pianissimo section where they're just sustaining this almost like harmonium texture in the background and i have them put that in um uh, i don't know what you mean xx would because of the read uh do i like good night moon you mean the children's book have you ever played multiphonic notes in a piece that call for it to play lower notes like A flat? Yes. Uh, here's the thing. I'll get my bassoon out. They don't work. Uh, the only person I've ever heard to, uh, sorry about bumping the mic, uh, that could actually get the notes to sound correctly was Christian Omar Roma, Ronas. Um, and he could do it. I have been toying with him for something like 20 years. And... I still can't. So that's a multiphonic low A. It, I mean, it's there, but doesn't work very well. Uh, and I know fingerings down to like G flat, but again, they don't work very well. Yes, I can play oboe too. I just don't have one. Um, that's not one that I'm going to go out and buy a cheap Chinese one. 
Uh, tuba in a melodic way, yes. Uh, so yeah, if you want to hear great melodic tuba playing, go find Oystein Bodsvik. Uh, he really opened up my eyes to what um, uh, a tuba can do melodically. I've heard him live in concert a couple times. Um, and he does just amazing melodic things with the tuba. But what you have to understand with someone like Oystein is he's playing on a smaller E flat tuba and not the big B flat tubas that everybody in American bands use. The smaller tubas, the E flat and the Fs are much more melodic. Um, fun fact, if you stick a detached horn bell in an alto sax, you can get the low A. Well, you don't even need to go that far. Watch, alto sax. That's written A. All I have to do is press it against my leg. And I get a low A. Uh, I was broken and I played a low note and I got a whole chord. Yep. Uh, I know plenty of fingerings on the bassoon that can do that. Uh, what do you think the hardest instrument to play versus the hardest instrument to be good at? Um, those aren't really... I don't... Bill, this is not, not going to come... A, not, nothing against you. I don't like um, est questions. The most, the best, the hardest. Because there's no answer to them. Um, each instrument presents its own set of challenges. Um, and no one instrument really is going to be harder than another. They each present their own um, own real unique uh, just set of skills that you've got to develop. One of my pet peeves is when a band director doesn't have good instrument placement. Uh, what do you mean by instrument placement? Putting people on the right instruments or seating arrangement? Yes, uh, Von Williams Tuba Concerto. Beautiful stuff. And yes, it, it's for the E-flat tuba. Uh, the E-flat tuba is the de facto tuba used in Britain. So the person he wrote it for, and I'm blanking on the name right now, um, pretty much used exclusively the E-flat tuba. Seating arrangement for instruments. Um... There is no set seating arrangement for wind band. Um, and that's something I really want to address in the second edition of volume one of band orchestration is talking about seating arrangement. Uh, being a bassoon player, I have sat everywhere from the back row to the front row, dead center on the edge in the middle. Um, so it's just, uh, the seating arrangements are hard. Gold, silver, is there such a difference as the result in, in constructing instruments? Um, yes and no. If the instruments are constructed exactly the same out of different materials with exact same proportions, you will should hear no difference. Um, but... The, the problem is that different materials lend themselves to different flaws, different shapes. So there will be some slight differences. Um, a lot of it has to do with the weight. So if, again, there it's so, so minute that an average listener won't be able to hear any difference at all. Uh, horns never get challenging enough music in the parts, so and you're yelling at me. Thank you. Um, well, a lot of times you have to look at what the role of your instrument is. The horn will never get as challenging uh, a part as, um, as any of the woodwinds. It's simply because that's the, the role of the horn. Yeah. It's, it's a sustaining harmony instrument a lot of times. You're going to get some nice lyrical stuff. Uh, but the, the technique stuff is something you just don't... I, I don't write a lot of technical stuff for horn in my, my stuff. I mean, I'm working on Symphony 3 right now. And 
I don't like the sound of technical stuff on horror. I'd much rather hear big lyrical stuff, um, fanfare type stuff, but none of this finger flying. It, to me, it just doesn't come across as effective on the horn with the um, with the tone color it has. Uh, do you have any particular approach to score study? Uh, let's see. Talking about score study, it a lot. There's a lot of different ways to go about it. Um, what, probably the most effective way is to look at each line individually. Look and see what is the player doing. Um, if you just read each line straight across, that will give you a real insight into that think about what think about the musician and not the composition that really helps um you can also analyze it for chords um but i i really think analyze linearly not vertically uh first flutes are the second row behind clarinets that's unfortunate why are there not enough contrabassoons in the wind band on average? Because a decent contrabassoon costs between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars. You don't have a lot of schools that are going to buy that. In fact, my undergrad university did not have a contrabassoon until several years after I graduated. So it it is the most expensive instrument there is. You don't have enough bassoons usually to fill out the section. Therefore, you're not going to go to the investment of buying a contrabassoon. Uh, the wolf tone on violence. Unfortunately, I am not a string expert. I cannot answer that question for you. Um, I guess you guys want me to talk more about score study. Um, I've got a whole stack. There's a contrabassoon at your high school. What high school? I mean, I know there are a few, particularly some of the really big high schools here in Texas, but um, those are like the, the huge six A's that have more money than God. Well, Academy of Fine Arts, yeah, I could see that. Uh, but by and large, uh, you don't see high schools with them. What are the chords in your symphony too that the low clarinets are playing? Are you talking about the very beginning? Because it's a it's a 45, 48 minute long piece to and they analyze all the chords. Okay, beginning. I've got the score right here. Symphony two. Um, I don't think that chord can actually be analyzed. To be perfectly honest. Oh, so. <laughs> this is the, the chord. So let's see. I've got F, uh, E natural, B natural, E natural, G. So it's a G minor plus A and C. So it's G minor on the bottom plus an A and C on top of that. And G, da, da. you could almost analyze it as uh, an A minor seven in second inversion. Any ideas on how to encourage greater numbers of double reeds in school band ensembles? Yes, I have some ideas on this, and it's what I successfully did when I was band director. Um, now, you have to assume that the band actually owns the instruments. I can't help you if the band doesn't own the instruments. Um, but if you have the, uh, uh, the instruments, the physical instruments there, the, the best way to create interest is to um, create a sense of scarcity. If you talk about these instruments like they're scarce, they're rare, it's simple supply and demand economics. Low supply, high demand. If you say these are rare, endangered instruments um, that... Uh, you get that feeling for the kids that 
man, I'm going to be something special. And that that has worked for me in the past. Uh, a new name for the chord. Eh. Why are there so many different octaves in the, the low clarinet? Uh, Raphael, exactly what do you mean? Um, a bass clarinet. Um, so you mean like, why does the bass clarinet is, why is it able to play like four and a half octaves? I mean, how can you project more on horn? Air, air, air. What is the science between the stuffy clarinet B flat note? Okay. Science time. Okay. So the science behind it, we have our register key here. This is the vent that controls both the octave and the B flat. It is an acoustic compromise for um, the, the note. It, it correctly placed, the B flat vent is right here where the side trill key is. This gives you an acoustically correct E flat or, or throat B flat. Notice the difference here. It is not in the same position. Uh, so we've got an acoustical compromise here. And because this hole here is undersized, it's just really, uh, it's a poor design, to be honest. Um, why, uh, okay. Uh, a better design here, though much more complicated, is what you can see here on this alto clarinet. It's got a double key. This is the acoustically correct position for the B flat. And this is the, the actual octave or register key here. So the larger clarinets have a much better job than the, the regular soprano clarinets. So why are the different registers so different sounding? Okay. Um, it, it has to do with the overblowing of the twelfths. Uh, you... Uh, the lack of harmonics in the upper octave versus a little bit more richness in the, the lower octave. Uh, and it, there is a distinct difference uh, between the, the Chalamo range and the Clarino range. And that's how it is on every clarinet. It's um, just, just part of the physics of overblowing the 12th instead of overblowing the octave. Uh Yes, we all love alto instruments. I've got alto clarinet, alto sax, alto recorder. Uh, though, to be honest, alto clarinet, I think, is a bad name for the instrument. And in fact, in all of my writings, uh, this this gets referred to as uh, really, it, it truly is a tenor clarinet because that's the role it it. Um, it, it produces. How do you hit altissimo on alto saxophone? I am really pretty poor at um, altissimo on sax. Surprisingly, the saxophone I best at it on is soprano. Um, you've got to, it's it's all about voicing. Um, you can study the fingerings all day long, but if you're not doing the correct voicing in your throat and your mouth, you're not going to hit it. Uh, that's something you need to work on with a teacher. Alto trombone, yes, I, I do really like the alto trombone. Can I attempt playing the famous bass clarinet part from the Grand Canyon Suite? No. Don't have it. My skills on bass clarinet are not that good, and my bass clarinet still is not 100% um, functional right now. Low brass family. Uh, yes, we do like our, our low brass, but we like low reeds better. Quick question, B flat in the middle of the treble clef for flute. Can it be played mezzo forte? Sure. It's super easy. You don't really get to the, the, the soft low stuff. And forgive me, I, I am not a good flute player. Uh, it started on E there. F should be okay. But yeah, once you're you're around there, you should be fine. 
Uh, Basset horn, is that different? Why is it an F? Basset horn is the older instrument. Um, a basset clarinet. Yes, Emily is correct. Uh, basset horn is an F. Basset clarinet is an A. Though, the, I don't even like the term basset clarinet. Um, it, it's just an A clarinet with an extension of low C. There's no real uh, reason to call it a different name. Um, the the basset clarin the basset horn is a narrow bore instrument. So uh, this instrument here is uh, an eighteen millimeter bore. A a true basset horn is going to be about sixteen uh, fifteen and a half to sixteen millimeters bore. So it's a, about uh, two millimeters narrower than this. Yes, contra alto clarinet. Love contra alto clarinet. Again, I don't like the name of it though because it's just a poor name. Contra alto doesn't mean anything. About repairing saxophones. Uh, go find uh, Matt Store's um, saxophone repair channel, and I've learned a lot of stuff just by watching YouTube on that. Uh, S T O H R or H E R. Um, I'll send you a link, Juan, on Facebook. Uh, but I, I've learned so much just by watching the YouTube stuff. And a lot of it's just trial and error. The more you can uh, play it, uh, if you understand the mechanics of the saxophone, should there be the contra alto? No. Why would you call it a baritone? Okay. Uh, let Well, somebody mentioned the cono sax. Yes, cono sax is pretty darn cool i have played one um it is the only time i have shaken visibly when holding an instrument when i know that that instrument costs more than my house does so i the last one that sold sold for like a hundred grand yes i have played a cono sax um so contra alto clarinet all right um, so here, here's my thinking on that. We can't rename the bass clarinet. That's been around for over 200 years is the name. Bass has to stay. Uh, the, really, the, the best name I've come, come up with is uh, great bass. This is a term used back in the Renaissance for uh, large recorders, large dulcians, crumb horns. So the term great bass refers to an instrument bigger than the bass, but not a full octave lower. So it's the perfect name for it, the great bass clarinet. And that way there is um, um, no confusion, whether it be, you say contra bass clarinet, well, is that E flat or B flat? In Brazil, we call the bass clarinet a clarone. Yes, and uh, that's derived probably from the Italian. Uh, I, don't, I don't know Portuguese, I am, I'm sorry, but in Italian, clarone, um, it, one means just big. So the, the only problem with the term clarone is that it can be applied to pretty much any of the uh, the big clarinets. But uh, particularly, you'll see it in Italian scores, clarone. Yes, it is a great instrument. Um, that is probably the next instrument I'm going to purchase is a, a contra alto or great bass clarinet. And I am working on some designs to do an extension on it down to low C. Uh, same with, I'm, I'm working on some, some designs to um, get uh, low C instruments. In fact, I have part of a Contra Alto here already. Several, uh, about a year ago, I bought a Contra Alto clarinet bell. Just the bell, bare brass. This is a, a Selmer Paris bell, so it's, you know, a real thing, and found it on eBay for like 20 bucks. So eventually this will probably go on the, the horn. Yeah, it, it is a big bell, though me holding it closer to the camera it gives you a little bit of distortion. It's not re as big as you think it is. It's... Uh, right around the same size as Barry Sachs Bell, but obviously much narrower. 
All right. The Yes, horn in both Spanish and Portuguese is trompa, which has thrown me off on multiple occasions. Yes, musicians don't have money. I, I, I know how that is. Uh, yeah, so the, yeah, this bell is uh, a contra alto, or even a, the contra alto and contra bass clarinet from Selmer both use the same bell on their instruments. So, yeah, that's what that is, and it's for a future project. Once I find an uh, old beat up contra alto clarinet to purchase. Yeah, and only, it's only the Selmer Paris bells that are that big. Every every other manufacturer has smaller, normal bass clarinet sized bells. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think that constitutes more than one wish, XX would. Yeah, the, the Selmer Paris are generally the uh, the expected standard of contra alto clarinet um that said the the bundies are essentially the selmer paris just made in plastic most people don't realize that so if you want to find an old beat up bundy contra alto that's the way to go and i can actually take that old bundy and put that bell on there and it'll look just like a and play just like a um uh selmer paris I wish to hear more flugelhorn solos. Uh, Lincolnshire Posey, third movement. In if they play the B or uh, the A version, I should say. So there's two versions of the third movement of Lincolnshire. One has a long flugelhorn solo, and uh, the other version has a long soprano sax solo. Um, if you look for Warren Benson's piece, uh, the Solitary Dancer, it's either the Solitary Dancer or the the Passing Bell. That's got a nice flugelhorn duet in it. Do I like Frank to Kelly? I've met Frank once. I am not a huge fan of his music. Uh, I've played a lot of his stuff, Angels of the Architecture, Symphony 2, a bunch of the uh, smaller stuff. It's, just, it's never struck me as stuff that I really like. Um, I, I kind of judge band composers on how well they write for bassoon and if they can write for bassoon and, and this is there's some some judgment um some uh some evidence behind this if they know what they're doing with the bassoon that means they know what they're doing with every other instrument so if you can look at it from what are they doing with the least instrument then they know what they're doing with everybody what are mistakes band composers make in writing for bassoon uh Keeping it as a bass instrument the whole time. Playing in the low register gets boring, it gets tiring, and we like playing in the high register more. It's where we can sing and be melodic. And bassoon's a much more melodic instrument. All these low, punchy stuff, it, it's not it's not fun for bassoonists. Give us something to sing. Go look, go study a Beethoven symphony and look at how he writes for bassoons, except for Symphony 4. Uh, but all the other symphonies, uh, just absolutely beautiful writing for bassoon. Uh, doubling, yeah, doubling us with you. Uh, Eric, I, I will give one one exception to that. The the first time I really uh, heard a passage of orchestration that just blew me away in wind band writing was. I was in ninth grade in the all region band. We were playing Johann de May's uh, Lord of the Rings symphony, just the first movement. And the opening melody is bassoon, euphonium and Barry sax all in unison. And man, that sound, that was just a, um, just this almost cello like sound just from the combination of those three instruments, that kind of doubling really, really worked. Just the bassoon and Euphonium and Barry Sachs all together in unison in the really low range. In fact, um, he's going below E in the staff, so down to like D's and C's on the euphonium. Is there a lecture somewhere how to write a triple sharp or flat? Just no. Don't. 
Now, your players write the music in the way that is easiest for the players to read. If you start writing stuff that is uh, just unconventional, um, I think Emily's right. I think Alcon did it in one of his piano works, but a tri triple sharp, triple flat are theoretically possible, but make things easy for the musician. Don't make things harder than they need to be. Yes, double sharps and double flats are uh, generally okay. Um, how do you notate a cadenza? You write a fermata and put the word cadenza over it and then let the player go to town. You don't, uh, generally, you don't write a cadenza. The, the player does that. Um, my bucket list is to play the Hecophone part in the Alpine Symphony. Yeah, the the... That said, though, uh, it, it should now be played on the Lupophone. Uh, the loop, the the new Lupophone by Wolf is designed specifically to play the Alpine Symphony. Um, it descends to a, a written low F, which is below the range of the heckle phone, but and the, the Lupophone can do it. But it's uh, both uh, surprisingly. I know, uh, like. I can call on four different Hecklephone players right now that I know um, if I needed to get the instrument part covered. Um, uh, why don't you like the Lupophone? It's able to play in tune, where the Hecklephone uh, really can't. Why is there so much horn in movies? Um, because horn records well, it's heroic, it's epic, and it's been that way since... I mean, you go back to biblical times, it's the horns. All right. Uh, so we have someone new here, SSS. Hi. Where are you from? Pittsburgh. I'm sorry. All right, anybody have any other questions? West Virginia. Well, Emily's on the other side of the border. Me, I'm I am from Texas. Um all right, so uh, talking about not liking the, the Lupophone, um, I'm not sure where the dislike is coming from. Here's the problem with the Heckle phone. They have stopped production on those. The last Heckle phone was manufactured in 2006. Um, only about 150 were ever made. Um, of those, about half are still in use. So you're looking at about, really between about 60 and 70 are still in use. Uh, the Lupophone is, is new. You can still get one. It's considerably less expensive than the Heckle phone. Plus, it has a bigger range. It gives you about the same sound, um, and it can play in tune with better mechanics. Uh, there's not really a downside to it. Um, that, that said, uh, I knew Guntram Wolf personally before he, he passed away, and I, I can attest to him and um um it, his son Peter and Benedict Eppelsheim all being able to produce a masterful instrument. Uh see any instrument that can replace the heckle phone? Well it's it's the lupophone, the, the new instrument from Wolf. Full disclaimer, I do play on uh a uh, wolf bassoon, so Thoughts on ratio of woodwinds to brass. Uh, in general, it should be about 60%, 40%. You should always have uh, more woodwinds than brass, simply uh, for, for volume issues. Uh, woodwinds will not produce as much sound. Uh, I, could, I could even be swayed as much as 70-30, but by the time you get to 50-50, the woodwinds are going to get drowned out. 
What do I think about the didgeridoo? I think I left my didgeridoo in the other room. I've owned a didgeridoo now nearly 20 years. Contra bassoon or contra forte? Hands down, contra forte. Uh, I am a contra bassoon specialist. I um, made my living for a few years being a contra bassoonist. After playing the contra forte a couple times, there's no comparison. Uh, contra bassoon, you uh, struggle to play on. It's um, mechanically clunky. It doesn't play easily. Contra forte, you just blow into it and it goes. I, I, I'd much rather have an instrument that's easy that I can sound good on. Uh, but, um. So it, it looks beautiful sound. I just don't like the way it looks. Hey, I don't it, instrument looks. It, I think it's a beautiful instrument. If you really look at it, it's designed absolutely beautifully. Is it difficult to get a, a Contra Forte? No, you just got to order one from Wolf for about 40 grand right now. Uh, do you write the intro first or leave it for last? I generally write the intro first. I need to know where I'm starting to know where I'm going. Uh, a lot of my composition is stream of consciousness. Um, if I don't know where I'm starting, I have a hard time from their developing themes. Uh, that said, I'm trying to think. There are... Um, any cases where I have written the opening later? And I don't think I have. Is horn a low brass or a woodwind? Horn is a brass instrument. It's not a, lo a low brass instrument. It's uh, technically you group it in the high brass. Um, but it, because of its historical use within the woodwinds, going back into the Baroque era, the classical era, it functions um, much more like a... Uh, a woodwind it but depends on the circumstance so it's it's a real musical bridge between the two can i tell you some funny concert stories um i can't really think of anything funny right now generally when we get to concert we try and keep everything as professional as possible um Oh, there was a rehearsal once where uh, a good friend of mine, who's now a big time com uh, conductor, was desperate to get a uh, a uh, another bassoonist to come and play his concert he was conducting, and he said, "Brad, I I gotta have you come play bassoon. I'm desperate. All my other bassoonists have backed out." And of course, I was only living two blocks away from the rehearsal hall, so I said, "All right." Uh, what Robert didn't know is that I had downed like three beers right before I went to it. So I've sloshed through the whole rehearsal. Uh, of course, I don't drink anymore. Uh, do I think about contemporary music, writing and playing it? Uh, it well, everything written today is contemporary music. That's kind of what the, uh, the, the word contemporary mean. Um... Are you meaning more um, modern style, like with extended techniques or whatnot? Uh, Eric, a lot of orchestral horn parts go low. When is it useful to use this range over a trombone or euphonium? Um, it depends on the sound you want. Uh, my suggestion is go listen to the... Uh, there's a passage in the Shostakovich 5, and I think it's in the last movement where you just have this ripping low horn section. Um, and man, that is just this great punchy low horn sound. It's four horns in unison. Um, what is it? Uh, how would you write for a small church wind ensemble? Um, it depends on what the ensemble is made up of. There, uh, The first thing for me in a, in a church wind ensemble that would go would be tuba, um, probably followed very closely by the trombones and then the saxophones. Um, the Those heavy instruments don't work well. I played lots of church gigs. Um, and, man, one time we tr they tried using two tuba players, and, oh, it's a disaster. Uh, tuba will just 
to drown at everything. If you can do a, a woodwind quintet and two horns and two trumpets, I think you're good for a church, small church wind ensemble. Um, it depends on the size of the choir. Um, in general, the more, the bigger the choir, the bigger the ensemble can be. In general, I find church choirs to be really weak because they're made up entirely of amateurs or almost entirely of amateurs. Um, can't keep a city beat after two beers. Yeah, I probably couldn't either, but I, you know, I haven't had anything to drink in seven years. So I'm not worried about that anymore. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, orchestral horn. Horn has this huge range that most people uh, don't realize. It has the exact same range as the bassoon. So it can go all the way down to those bass notes and go just soaring high. Trying to write a song that has a rustic feeling uh, from music composition class. What key gives out that feeling? Totally depends. Um, a lot of times it's more about the, the melody rather than the key. You could write rustic feeling in D flat. You could write it in F. It's um, it's really about the melody. It's about the instrumentation you're using. I love a stupidly high, fast horn part, personally, over the most lung-crumbling low parts, but love sharing euphonium part. Uh, there, I have per personal opinion, I've... I've Nothing really I can say on that. Um, again, I don't write a lot of fast horn stuff. The the fastest horn stuff there is a wickedly um, difficult part for horns in my, my symphony two, right at the the biggest climax of the piece, and it's just all six horns just ripping on high C's, and it's just it's a siren going off literally. All right, we got any more questions? Taking a coffee break. Yeah, my coffee's still sitting here and just cold as can be because I think I've been talking nearly two hours. Yeah. Oh, what would you use as a base for small wind ensemble? Uh, a bass clarinet. Uh, if, if you really... Uh, it, you uh really you know just need a soft bass uh, i assume you're samuel you're referring back to the the choir question bass clarinet is just a miracle of nature for that kind of stuff emily i, I sometimes drink too much coffee as well uh, get all sorts of jittery All right, guys, give me about uh, 30 seconds. i got to run and grab something real quick, and I will be right back. Talk amongst yourselves. All right, I'm back. Uh, allergies hit me uh, hard today for the first time in spring. So I know that for our, our northern people, that's, uh, you know, they're still not in spring yet. Yes, Eric, you can have a party while I'm away. Let's get drunk on coffee. I'd have to go brew another pot. All right, anybody have any more uh, band or orchestration or composition questions? Uh, if we do this again, would people be interested? Is there any way to effectively write for college bassoon and 2D? Um, yes, you're not going to hear it. Uh, you're more going to feel it. Um. 
case in point, um, probably what a, uh, a really favorite situation I had when playing Contrabassoon is I was called in to play uh, Beethoven Five. Um, I came in just for the, the dress rehearsal and the concert, just played the contrabassoon part on Beethoven 5. And the orchestra I'd been playing, I was playing with, uh, it was not used to it. And what the, the contrabassoon did is because the peg is sitting on the, the stage, on the floor, what it's doing is it's really, it's, it's not transmitting so much the sound out to the audience, is it's transmitting the sound out to the other players. So it gave this uh, more of a psychological effect that the other players could hear it, they could feel it, and it changed how the other players played, which I found absolutely fascinating. Um, they said, we played differently because we could hear uh, and feel those notes from the contrabassoon. Euphonium or baritone? If you're writing for wind band, you're writing for euphonium. Bar um, I can count on uh, two fingers the number of times I've seen a real live actual baritone. Um, there are a couple of pieces, Lincolnshire Posey and the Holst Suite in E-flat in the original orchestration, not the, the balderized version that Colin Matthews did that everybody plays, that call for both euphonium and baritone, but otherwise it's all euphonium all day long. Would you rather play the oboe de more or the flute part for Bolero? Uh, considering I could probably play the oboe de more part, I don't think I could play the, the flute part. I'd probably go with the de more part. Uh, but uh, the de more part is a double part. It's between uh, second oboe and de more. So I'll probably do, I may do one of, one of these hangouts once a month or so, and we can just kind of keep this going. I think there's a lot of positive feedback. All right, so in, anything else? I know we've been going nearly two hours. Uh, night one, thank you for staying up with us. And I may do this at a, a different uh, time for our uh, European uh, friends. Um, I know it's, it's late over there. Uh, I put this more for the... Um, uh, the American people who were getting off work at the time. But yeah, I, th I think once a month sounds good. Uh, now, Eric, back to something you had mentioned um, a while ago about going uh, reviving the, the old instrumentarium podcast. Actually, what I'm thinking about doing, I haven't finalized this yet, is actually um, starting a new podcast, um, basically like interview format, um, where I... It, like uh, a band band nerd podcast, band nerd cast, where I interview different people associated with wind bands, composers, conductors, performers. I, I'm starting to toy around with that idea. Uh, yes, Swan, thank you for, for coming back. Yes, um, I, I, I plan on doing this more often. I, this is kind of fun you get to hang out with people. Um, on bassoon, which high C sharp fingering do I use? Okay. I assume we're talking uh, really high C sharp, this one. Uh, it's high D and high C key together. One, three. Uh, pinky. One, three here. if you're talking about the C sharp, the octave lower, that's a different story. That's a confusing note. All right. So if there are any more questions, we can probably start look at wrapping this up. I am, I'm down to go as long as anybody has questions, but you know, two hours is... <laughs> Rafael, thank you for joining us uh, all the way from Brazil. Glad you could, glad you could make it.
All right. So I think we this uh, we can probably go ahead and end it here unless anybody has any more questions. Um, I'll stick around for another minute or so, but I think that's probably just about it. And I guess this will go um, uh, as a recorded on the YouTube channel so people can watch it. All right. Well, it looks like no more questions coming in. So I will schedule another one of these for about a month from now. And we can go from there. Uh, tell friends, um, more people here, the more interesting we can uh, get into questions. So glad everybody's here. Um, and we'll do this again. So thanks, guys.